Hi, good evening, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me fine. Uh, welcome to Public Text. This is our July edition. And thank you so much for joining us. My name is Asha, and I work with the IHS Word Lab and the library team, and together we host Public Text every month. Now, before we begin this evening's session, just a few things to keep in mind. Uh, please do post all your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll be taking questions at the end of the session. Uh, we'll be also recording the session to be put up on the IHS YouTube channel. So we'll be sharing the link of YouTube channel, so please do pass that on. And if you want to stay updated with all the events that IHS does, just drop us your email in the chat box and we'll add you to our mailing list. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our guests for today. Uh, we have Krupa Ji and Gautam Bhatia with us, and they'll be talking about Krupa's debut novel, What We Know About Her. Uh, before we start, just uh, a couple of introductions. Uh, Krupa is a writer from Madras. She's the author of a novel, What We Know About Her, which is what we'll be talking about today, and a narrative nonfiction book, Reverse Remember. Her reportage uh, and cultural writings have appeared in the Hindu, First Post, and the New Indian Express, among other Indian and international publications over the last 13 years. Gautam Bhatia, who will also be moderating this discussion, is the coordinating editor of Spain Horizons, an award-winning weekly speculative fiction magazine, and the author of The Wall, a science fiction novel. In his spare time, he moonlights as a, as a constitutional lawyer and writer. Uh, thank you both for joining us. Uh, we're so happy to have you. And Gautam, it's all yours. Hi, hi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for calling me on here. Uh, I just thought the way we do this is that we just have like a, a freewheeling conversation for about the first 45 minutes and um, and then open it up to um, to Q&A. So I thought I'll, I'll just dive right in. I think like, like all very good books, uh, what we know about uh, resists any kind of easy taxonomy or classification. Uh, but I think if you if you pair away uh, pair it away to its basics. It's essentially um, the story of of two women separated by around eighty years, nineteen forty and two thousand twenty. Uh, Lalita and Yamuna, and you know, and it's it's their story, and and you know the the, the lives they live and the circumstances that they find themselves in. Um, and I wanted to begin with. Um, so I have when I read a book, I I I make copious notes, uh, specifically when I, I come across a book that makes me think a lot. And I want to begin my my question, my first question, if I may, uh, by read, reading out a, sh a short passage uh, from somewhere near the uh, near the beginning um, of, of the novel, which is um, which is about uh, it's about it's about correspondence and um, and how the story of Lalita, Lalita is is told through uh, a series of letters that are written by her and about her by others uh, so so here's what the what the passage uh, what the passage says um, and this is the narrator yamuna talking um, this time though the book lay neglected i spent most of my two days on the train reading my grandmother's letter and then rereading it I'd have to ask my grandfather about it, ask if he had had more letters from her. I deleted all my messages and emails as soon as I read them. I didn't want to leave anything. I didn't want to leave behind anything I'd written. Memories are what photographs are for. Correspondence is different. They are short in love and long in hate. I love this line, by the way. Uh, at least that's what I thought then. So this letter, all this talk of love from the matriarch was beguiling to me. My grandfather wrote a lot as well, but I didn't think much of his writing. Men wrote, I took that for granted. I didn't think women would leave their letters lying about. So I was going to begin with this. Just talk us through this choice to unpack or reveal Lalita's story through letters. Um, you know, and, and, and what led to that narrative choice? And you know, what were you thinking you know, when you were composing those letters? Okay. Thank you so much, Gautam. I, um, I really loved your novel as well, The Wall. I've, I've made some notes about that as well, which I'm going to do in the end. And thank you for your very, very thoughtful questions. Um, uh, I think one of the reasons uh, that a lot of feminist writing or women's writing is in this manner, you know, in 
manner of other people's correspondences or is especially when it's set in the past is i think uh, because it is uh, unfortunately uh, among the few ways in which we can know about their lives uh, because they are so often left out of history you know so often left out of family lore and and you know this you get to hear snippets and you get to hear snatches and and uh, even when it's uh, you know something scandalous uh, when it's about men the record stays stronger and for longer and for when it's about women it tends to be brushed aside or it brushed under the carpet and you're not really supposed to carry those story forward into the future you know because of the way our society functions because of this whole concept of purity of women and all of that so um so for me uh, the use of uh the letters was just to sort of uh uh you know understand how to uh, for the reader to sort of understand how to uh, you know how women sort of carried out their own secret worlds even when under so much scrutiny uh because they did women were not just pure souls that the people want us to believe that but women have had a past for a very very long time and it's just that they're often left out of family lore right and so i wanted uh to use there is also a sense of intimacy and some amount of secrecy that uh, is there when you write a letter to somebody like a physical letter and i was just saying this to somebody the other day when you uh, you know if we die in the future and then somebody is given in, given charge of uh, our emails it would seem almost cruel to let those emails circulate uh but then letters don't feel that way uh you know you feel there's some amount of nostalgia there's a little bit of uh, i don't know romance of the paper and the ink and the fact that somebody physically wrote it so these are things mainly because of the fact that sorry i think you've muted you accidentally muted yourself so I... Um, is this me or are you still muted? I, I can see the mute button next to you. Yeah, I think. Ah, okay. Thank you. you. I can hear okay. now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. So yeah. So for me, the the main reason for the letters was, uh, you know, it was just the legitimate way to have women leave something behind, which they're not allowed to otherwise. Especially the particular community you're referring to here in that particular milieu. You know, I think I think that's really interesting because I mean the the, the phenomenon that that you've that you've referred to effectively you know, the hidden transcript uh, or the off stage transcript um, what you, you commonly uh, what you commonly read is that it's normally oral in nature you know as kind of a counterpoint to to writing because you know writing is is a privilege or a luxury um, that uh, is often kind of you know uh, seized by the more powerful. whereas here the the choice of it actually is to to use that same uh, the same idiom the, the language of writing uh, to you know have that counter uh, that counter uh, discourse you 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 didn't go with the oral with the oral kind of like you know the the, the, the more traditional way which is to which to counterpoise the oral to the written but you actually had it like you know uh, the written against the written so was right. that a conscious conscious choice on your part also because i mean there's so much to do with music in 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 this book right which is of course the quintessentially you know oral medium uh so was that a conscious choice to to make it about writing so uh, actually one of the things uh that putting it in letters made it easy for me was to directly hear from the women themselves and that was something that i wanted to i was very sure of even before i started writing the book which is that the women would have to speak for themselves and i wanted to uh see how i could do that and this just happened to be the most efficient way of doing it initially i'd actually written it as sort of like diary entries and letter to stuff and then later i thought it it was just getting too chaotic and so i decided it would just be you know letters and this is one uh, autobiography somebody else is that's just stuck in between uh you know so the easiest way to for for me to uh, make you believe that we we have gone into the past and we are listening directly from somebody who's not in the present was you know at that point um, I, i thought it it was instead of jumping from one person's narrative to another person's narrative i thought this would give me a very clean uh surface to work with 
and uh, but at the end of it the 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 idea really was that i wanted as many women to speak as possible uh, in first person through the book and right. that is what i was trying to do because i've been obsessed with this idea of the female gaze for a while now and even with cinema i write about uh, you know what women are seeing uh, when they are and so for me with my first work because it's so special and i wanted it to be a record of of being able to see this world uh, as women because we have a very very different vantage point especially unique to our society which is a patriarchal society that is structured around caste uh, so uh, women from the upper caste actually have a very different vantage point and they are in the most ideal position to betray the caste so you know, you know that's, that's really uh, so th- that what you just said you know, it, it, i have like three or four different lines of of questioning based on that um, i want to like i want to begin with so by by quoting another uh, another passage in the in the book that comes a little later on uh, so throughout the book there is a a struggle right um between yamuna who wants to to read the letters to to know as much as she can about lalita's life because you know all that she has to go by is kind of a very public perception of this carnatic music performer who was you know um who who was very daring very adventurous on stage had a had a charisma a persona uh, she wants to know more about her through these letters um and of course there are there are there are people members of a family who you know are are not very comfortable with uh, with her accessing and reading those letters and so towards the the end of the book you have this this uh, this line uh, where she is told um, I'll quote well no one owes you that letter please remember this so if and i apologize in advance for my pronunciation uh, you know of of names um, so if saveri decides you don't get to read it you won't that's her right um, she went silent for a few seconds and then made up her mind so i was wondering in, in that context when you say that that the the um the, the motivation behind using the narrative device of correspondence uh, to bring out women's voices in in first person um is in tension with uh with a basic intuition that we have that when we write a letter um it's meant for a very specific audience in most cases unless it's the kind of letter which we want would be you know read for ages to come because we are we are speaking to someone else um and also the fact that uh if you write a letter then does the recipient and the recipient kind of immediate circle have the right to decide who else gets read it or not or you know is it something that everyone then has the, has the right to access so so how do you how do you think of of the relationship between using the the medium of letters to bring out a first person voice and uh the fact that letters are in some sense a, a private form of communication right right so, so that that is um, you can see like you said you can see my own struggle with trying to uh you know decide at what point does she, does she get access to this and that is really the the point of this entire book uh in a sense uh, uh in, in which you use the authorial voice to control what your character is rewarded with and what she is rewarded with and in that sense um when i uh, when i wanted to when she finally got the letter right when she finally got to the final uh point of the book there are some people who told me that they found the letter to be a bit of a damp spot right and i think that was very very intentional right i uh and that is how i got that is how i think i got like all of these people's revenge back on the on yamuna herself because you were you were after something thinking you're going to find uh you know something titillating some scandalous or whatever right but then what you're finding is uh, real people and messy emotions and the kind of things that they were allowed to do back then and and the kind of things that they wouldn't be allowed to do so um in that sense that is why i think my uh final uh, uh you know the, the way i sort of wrap things up was also uh uh you know in a way it's not a, it's not a neat ending and i that is how i kind of reconcile 
No, it's, uh, that's really interesting to hear because sorry, one second. I think I'm, I think my video stopped. Uh, Frozen, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah, really no. interesting to hear. I, I, I recently came across a, a critic who was going and analyzing a book, and and one thing he said was that it as as a point of a criticism after you know bringing out of course its good qualities he said that the the book gives us an unearned happy ending and i think that one thing that your book doesn't do is it does not give us an unearned, unearned happy ending i think i think i think that's that's important so i think there's another kind of counterpoint to the damp script critique because it, it, <laughs> damp script is the only way to ensure that the readers don't get what in in the context of your book would be i think a very unearned uh, unearned happy ending um i uh, i want to go back to something that you said um earlier which is that the the use of letters to um to 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 bring out that that voice that is otherwise uh you know stifled uh by patriarchal structures uh, and i think that really is a good segue to um thinking about the other books that your book is in conversation with uh you know and and uh, i think it's very interesting so again again i'll i'll to 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 contextualize it i'll i'll read out um uh, a passage uh, from um from the book and then kind of you know uh, try and place it within within context so the passage begins it's somewhere in the, in the middle of of the book um when we hear stories of a 9 year old married or 13 year old made in charge of a household we think of them a certain way like my grandmother and uh, lalita amma i knew both women it's not all oh poor dear you know they were more than their marriages they had this ability to build worlds of their own limited entry in white only worlds where they did as they pleased they came and went as they pleased and spoke ate walked lived breathed as they pleased all the while aware of the fact that it was all brief and incandescence that it all had to be quickly dismantled and hidden away from those who sought to bind them but they were masters at constructing these worlds that could be made and unmade at will even in a deeply skewed world this was possible then it is possible now they were bound but they were still people each with their own quirks desires you will see uh, now though this this passage reminded me of, of a lot of a lot of stuff um, for example I, i remember reading about this uh, uh, chinese language that was a private language only women knew and and so they could communicate in that language without you know uh, anyone uh, any man understanding what they were talking about it reminded me of uh, leela abu logod's book wheel sentiments uh, where she talks about how bedouin women in in egypt um were able to express through poetry uh the kind of subversive um you know thoughts uh, emotions that they couldn't express through prose because because poetry was was considered to be non threatening um uh, you know and 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 that was kind of their private language uh but what it reminded me most of and this can be a pretty you know fairly uh, predictable um uh reference was elena ferrante's neapolitan novels uh because you know those novels are all about um how uh you know elena and 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 lila uh, are able to construct a, a world for themselves that's not only a place of sanctuary or refuge though it is that uh, but also a world of affirmation uh you know through language and other things so i was wondering how you how you see your book in conversation with the neapolitan quarter with ferrante's work uh, specifically with respect to um this kind of creation of a world within within a world right right absolutely i mean i think it uh, you know when uh, this particular voice that i have in this book is the culmination of several uh, you know years of reading uh women writers writing about women's intimate lives and you know you know you pretty uh, you pretty succinctly put it when you say that uh, it is in conversation with a lot of other works so for instance um uh, i love the work of jamaica kincaid who sort of writes about uh, uh what women are doing uh, uh, perils of video conferencing my head so just pen <laughs> can you say hi you can see yeah. Yeah, okay it works yes it it works um so it it is uh so, so for instance uh, one of the letters that come uh, at the uh, at the very end near almost near the very end of the book uh, i hid a little ode to jane austen's own personal letters um so she, austen used to uh, her writings are all over the place and you can read pretty much 
uh, in any any letter she wrote after she became famous and stuff. And so um, she would almost always begin her letters to uh, somebody saying that, you know what, I have to tell you this. Uh, you know, this is what happened. I will do the serious stuff later, but uh, I have something to gossip with you about right away. And I was thinking that, yeah, I mean, if you couldn't gossip with your best friend or your sister, uh, when she was right next to you, you would obviously have to write a letter and explain to her what happened. But the time the gossip reached her, it could be a while uh, later, and uh, you know. Um, so the influence of uh, several women writers, uh, you know, has also given me a way to see uh, uh, the, the whole way that I see, for instance. Uh, uh, with Lucy uh, and Annie John, which, which are both uh, Jamaica Kincaid's work, um, uh, I I got to learn a lot of how to um, how to how to sort of express your local idiom, which is something that somebody was telling me about uh, recently when they read the book, uh, which is that it feels uh, it feels like a translation, and and so these are things you can pick up from people who are. Uh, who are doing work that you that you want to do and that you uh, hope you can do for the people around, like for the women around us. So that is what. So I do see this book as a sort of a continuation of a tradition of uh, you know women's writing that, especially feminist writing that uses uh, texts as the basis for conversation for initiating conversation between two women and. You know, and, and that is a common feature. It's the color purple a lot. Anything that we admire of now. Yeah, no, I think, I think, sorry, sorry, go ahead. I interrupted you. No, that's it. So I think exactly on, on, on that point, uh, that, that last bit of, in this conversational form, um, is, is another, uh, so perhaps the, the book that, that yours most powerfully reminded me of is uh, Jennifer Makumbe's recent book, the, the First Woman, which came out last year. And I think it was really striking. But I think one thing I always love is is when there is a specific line, um, you know, that immediately brings to mind another line, and so you can see kind of this elective affinity between writers, this spanning uh, sometimes you know time uh, time spans sometimes spanning different countries, like like in your case. So um, you, uh, so and I noted on this page number, page 148, uh, you have a line where uh, the question is, is uh, how can women muster so much love for each other despite everything we do to each other? So that, that's the line in, in your book. Uh, and in, in The First Woman, um, which is also interestingly a, a generational novel um, that uh, you know, deals with three generations, um, and and there is a central conflict between two character, two women characters, uh, Kirabo and and Gibba, uh, and and so there, uh, Kirabo is told by by another character, um, you know, kind of in also a mentoring kind of a way, uh, that I'll, I'll quote I'll quote the line from from the first woman, so you can see the similarities. Uh, he says, uh, "My grandmother called it Kwayuma, and I again apologies for the pronunciation. My grandmother has called it Kwayuma. That is when oppressed people turn on each other." Or on themselves and bite. It is as a form of relief. If you cannot bite your oppressor, you you bite yourself. Uh, you know, I, I just think I was, I was so fascinated to think of how you know the two of the two of you come at this idea from a from a you know, different lens. But ultimately, the, the idea is is as I see it, the same idea. Right. Uh, so I was wondering if you could you know maybe elaborate a bit about this idea you know in 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 yeah. in, in the book as well. Yeah. 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 Um... There is a lot of camaraderie uh, among the women through in this book, but there's also a lot of betrayal. Uh, you know, uh, they are constantly doing that to each other, and and it could be because of circumstances. It, it could be because they are very very strong willed individualistic sort of women. Um, but uh, they, at some point, they do do. I mean, despite the fact that they love the other person, they are doing things very very big things that are wrong. Uh, to the women around them, and and I and I I wanted this also to be there. This was very deliberate because of this constant need uh, or this constant the manner in which uh, women of a certain caste and class are portrayed as being uh, pious or as 
women. So one of the things that somebody pointed out to me, uh, I mean, so I pointed out to somebody was that I hadn't read a novel in which an upper caste woman swears a lot. Uh, novels tend to put the put you know swear words in the mouths of uh, the marginalized very and when it it sounds so jarring when it but I've grown up hearing women swear and I I I see that it's not like they don't know what what bad words are they use them on their daughters all the time and so uh, I wanted to see that reflected the fact that uh, the women of this community, they wield some power. It's, okay, it's difficult to hear me. Uh, wait, just a uh, second. I'll adjust your mic. And then mute. I, I think you're still muted, you're, you're muted. Yeah. I think the administrator has to unmute you. Uh, yeah. Rita, uh, is it a bit clearer now? I, it's clear. Okay, yes. it is clearer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, great. Um, yeah. So, um, what was I, saying? I was saying that I, I wanted to see uh, them. To, I wanted to see them also turn on each other, but then, uh, which they do all the time. We do all the time, and then to also sort of, you know, uh, come together whenever it matters, and you know, that that was sort of the other thing. Very interesting thing that you mentioned about the first woman is actually when I, I read the book, I started reading the book. I, I'm not done with it yet, um, but I subscribed to Champaka's book subscription and we received the book some time ago. And I was reading the book and there were quite a few places where I did a double take. And uh, you know, after we discussed this briefly earlier, I went back to sort of look at the book and to see where I found, where I did this double take exactly. This is in two places. The first place is where uh, we are people separated by continents, and uh, this is what we have in common between Tamil Nadu and Uganda, if anybody cares. So one is this uh, almost uh, pleasurable experience of uh, killing mosquitoes. <laughs> we both have this, uh, you know, it, it's very, very, uh, I found that really amazing that she described it in such detail and killing a mosquito and I had done the same thing and the other was uh, a grandmother telling her uh, you know granddaughter to not spread her legs but to sort of put them together and sit down and I found that really really interesting that uh, uh, that, that both the books that talk about people who are so very different uh, apparently uh, have something especially the second part, right, about the grandmother telling the granddaughter to not keep her legs open, to keep it closed and all that. So I thought it was very, very telling of what kind of societies are found. And indeed, the, the entire dynamic between the, the grandmother and, and the granddaughter and you know, the skipping of, of one generation, um, because, you know, a certain kind of proximity that ironically doesn't allow for a certain kind of conversation to be had and therefore like it's it's the grandmother and the granddaughter whose relationship in in both you know books is is you know pretty central so i thought that was that was something that was um that was you know again a very striking striking point of, of commonality between uh between both books i think I, i'd love to see you know like a like a like a like a combined reading of, of the two books or you know have a, a discussion where the two books are actually put into conversation with each other because i think this is this is so much to unpack you know uh, uh, that that needs a full session in its own right so you know maybe maybe champaka can can do it sometime um, <laughs> uh, so so i think moving on from from this theme um, to something a little different so again i i think the best way is obviously to 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 you know exp to to contextualize it through a passage in the book so I'll, so I'll read out I'll read I'll read this um, this passage that's the, the very beginning of chapter three. Um, the chapter is called the dead and the, and the deities and it goes um, uh, I'll quote Hanuman Ghat was just as I remembered it. Some boys were chanting a sing in a sing song drawl. The smell of cow dung fused with that of vibhuti on the streets. The air was thick and stood still the way it did in homes inhabited only by the old. A painting of Hanuman carrying the Sanjeevi hill. A big fat mouse feasting on a bowl of laddus, a tiger chasing a deer like an 80s movie villain, wrestlers training for a kushti match, a group of men carried a dead body chanting Ram Nam Satya Hai, 
with a trumpet and a dholak leading the procession. Buffaloes jostled for space with rickshaws and men wrapped in heavily embroidered silk shawls and dhotis made their way swiftly to the ghat. Saris hung in chaotic grace from balconies. Telephone and broadband wires twisted around each other until you couldn't tell which was which, crisscrossing from lampposts to homes across the streets. Bikes and cycles leant against walls and dogs and cats seemed untroubled by the hustle and bustle. As I walked taking photos on my phone, I almost forgot where I was going. Uh, so I think I, what's, what's striking me is that it is, is the book is an intensely experiential kind of a book in that um, it's intensely visual, uh, very olfactory, very auditory. Uh, there's a lot to do with food and taste, uh, you know. So, so it is, it is, it is as if you're exploring, you know, turn by turn and sometimes all together, uh, you know, each of the senses. Uh, and, and it's really grounded in, you know, in, in a sense of place, right? Um, and so I was wondering if you could take us a bit through that, you know, like like the 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 act of 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 making your writing so grounded in in place, whether it's you know Banaras or Madras, uh, but you know to to make it about place so vividly. Yeah, yeah. So can you hear me? Yeah, I I can. Uh, can others okay. as well? Uh, so yeah. it's it's very interesting that you brought this up because it was in fact after a trip to Banaras that I decided to write this book. Um, the trip was uh, uh, after my grandmother died. My mother wanted to go to Banaras, and I sort of took her on. And we did a train journey. And then when we came back, some a lot of the imagery had sort of stayed with me. And I think it also had to do with the fact that I'm a South Indian uh, person who's sort of going through, uh, you know, the heartland for the first time, and sort of seeing a place like Banaras itself, which is so atmospheric and which is completely different from anything I've seen. Uh, uh, in the south, and so that is one reason why you know the the sense of place, especially of Banaras, uh, early on is very much. This is the Banaras of actually of two thousand nine. You know, this is the Banaras that I write about, and in over the years, I thought of really, really, I I really, really wondered if I should keep changing because Banaras today is a very, very different place politically as well as, uh, you know geographically as well, what is happening to the streets and, you know, to the guards. But uh, at some level, I thought I should preserve it. And so in the earlier versions of the book, the earlier trip, so the first trip to Banaras is almost like a time, time capsule to sort of preserve, uh, you know, the, the pre-Modi Banaras that I saw. And uh, the one you see later on that comes later on obviously happens in a post-CAA uh, world. And so there is some amount of, you know, police brutality can read about it stuff. So I but I the earlier part I really wanted to almost I wanted it to be like a postcard to my own uh, you know, my own self from that particular visit. As far as you know the way Madras uh, is written is concerned, I wanted to actually set a, a, a romance that unfolded on the streets of Madras, my mm. Madras, the city that I have grown up in and I felt like uh, I'd read romances that in my city, uh, but again, you know, for my generation, there is a certain there are, there are certain things that have a you know a special place in the city itself, and so I wanted I wanted that sort of you know like an homage to Madras, and and I I think I sort of deliberately had a lot of uh, the place itself because of that because I wanted this. Because the love story sort of happens in the backdrop of all of these uh, people becoming tourists in their own hometown. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think, uh, in fact, I, I was, I was thinking as I read the book that people from Madras would, would, I think, read it or at least the love story in a whole different way because each of those those places and those locations would, would carry their own, you know, language and their own history that that you know. Um, would would make it a completely different reading experience if if you, if you share that 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 vocabulary that comes from uh, that comes from uh, I think growing up in the same city it actually brings me to my next question. But before that, just to to remind everyone that you can ask questions in the in the in the Q and A, the Q and A icon is there for for the questions in case you have any, and you know we'll we'll have a, a some time time for that as well. So if you have any questions, just post them in the in the Q and A. Uh, so, so, so my my question about the city as well, and following following up from your answer there, was it was really interesting because uh, there, there's a point, there's a passage in in the in the book where you you talk you specifically talk about discovering the city 
through the eyes of of the two the two lovers in the book right uh, you know and, and there's a specific paragraph where it's actually about you know kind of discovering or rediscovering um when you're when you're in love um and then then towards the the end um again it's in a in a letter so the question is asked that uh, wouldn't it be better if i could ask to see those 100 autumns by myself uh, why do i need a man to see those many autumns of beauty and that that comes towards the end and again this is a kind of kind of generative kind of attention between the two things uh, so i was wondering if you could talk us a bit through the ideas of companionship uh, and solitude that both that run but both run through the book and specifically in the context of of women's lives uh, and how these two ideas of companionship and solitude are you know in play with each other through the course of the book that's beautiful um i, I think with um with lalita what i really wanted to do was you know for her the thing that she really needs is space which is just so constantly denied to her and with yamuna it is the it is the opposite she she has that space but she wants more of it and uh, and she doesn't know how to hold on to what she already has and it seems to be slipping away from her and uh, uh, on some level right i also there is one really really bad man in the book right i mean this just the, and so on some level i think i wanted to have several sweet men as well in the book to sort of uh, you know because otherwise it becomes like a very tragic you know like the old 90s tamil drama which you know men are just beating women up all the time themselves and so um and so i wanted there to be uh some men were very different who were completely in contrast with the person we are we are talking about and uh i wanted both women to sort of struggle with keeping that that man around uh you know that com- companion around and and, it, and it's it's uh, their generations away from each other but then the struggles almost seem similar it's almost like they you know they replaying what is happening and uh you know we think cast it dead and yamuna is so progressive but then there are so many little micro aggressions that yeah. are because of both so with her family and and so that is the question i wanted to you know leave, leave there you know happiness is there so companionship is there for you to take but are you willing to pay the price for it? because it comes with a price in our culture yeah no that's that's of course uh, that, and that came across very sharply you know i think in many places in in the book um so in view of the of the time so my last question for now at least and you know depending on 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 the q and a um is i think the most obvious one which is that uh, is that so much of of this book um is uh, set in and around uh, carnatic music community uh, in madras um and has to do with with music uh, you know right from lalita being like a a famous carnatic music performer and that is what she is known as even though her actual life history is much more layered and complex than that um down to present day and and you know uh, and, and of course the entire family is is very musical so i was wondering if you could if you could talk us a bit through you know how well a i guess uh the the relationship that music has had to to your life and you know and how kind of it it, it it percolates into into the uh into the um into the book and secondly of course uh, and and we 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 i think heard this a lot more recently uh the you know the patriarchal structures that kind of underpin um the the music uh, community and and how they and how they and this comes across in your book how they serve both to to liberate but also to constrain you know and there's this constant negotiation that's going on um where 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 music and the kind of the institution uh, the institutional community uh, can can be both freeing and stifling as well so i think yeah if you could take talk about both those things i think would be would be a, a, a great you know uh, right. segue into yeah yeah right right so uh, my grandfather was a musician and uh, and so music has been there in my life for a while he was in fact uh, uh, a harmonium player himself and so um and so that influence sort of definitely was there when i was writing this family setup and uh, uh of course 
uh, my spouse, Swaroop, is also a Carnatic musician. He's the Carnatic flute, and so I'm surrounded by Carnatic music often. And uh, uh, because uh, because I don't really get Carnatic music, I don't really, I'm not really so good at it either. I think I I wanted to, uh, I want I wanted to sort of get that world a little bit. I think this was my way of getting a little closer to you know to Swarup's uh, world as well. You know, so I I could learn quite a bit from him through this. And uh, this was an interesting way for us to have a conversation as well. So that is the life part. Um, but also because there was so much going on uh, in the 1940s around the Carnatic world. So I studied sociology in the University of Madras and the HOD was a was a very arrived and uh, he would speak a lot about, uh, you know, the non-Brahmin movement and the, uh, and the, uh, the abolition of the state caste system and, and, you know, all of this was playing out around, around the same time in the 40s in Madras. It was a very, very different sort of time uh, when uh, dancers like Bal Sarswati were saying they would want to continue their traditions and they do want, they don't want to be banned from anything that's forming them. Then you had somebody like Rukmi Devi, was, you know, trying to dance and she was, you know, there, there was a there was a tension that was going on between the two, uh, two sides uh, and they were both women. And so that conversation takes place in the book as well, whether women should be family women or whether they should be artists. And uh, and so I wanted to set this book primarily in 40s because of that, because Madras was in unbelievable space in the 40s. People were just fighting about everything. And there was a lot of negotiations going on. And a lot of what we see today in Tamil Nadu is thanks to that, you know, the, the 40s, the fact that 40s happened. So, so that is why, you know, you see the music world. Music world was also always political and politicized and uh, and so I wanted that to also be there. Um, and for, I think for women, right, the Carnatic music space, actually, I don't know if it's so liberating. It's, uh, I think it might have been in the 40s, they might have, and the following years, and the following decades. And, and at this point, I think women are less free than they were before. Uh, you know, in terms of even exploring. I, I don't think, for instance, the woman could wear a kurta and a jeans and perform today. <laughs> you know, she would be really, really taking the task. And then we saw what happened when they discovered Carnatic musicians were singing about Christian gods. Yeah. And, you know, and so, so, so it's, a, it's a very polarized space today, actually. And I think even more so for women. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting to talk about the 40s and how, how you know, alive it was because uh, not in, I mean, I, I you know, I'm not, uh, not very well acquainted with the history of Carnatic music, but at least in terms of, of you know, the, the legal space, there was a lot going on in Madras in the 1940s. And it's interesting that you have characters who are communists because, you know, there was like a really strong civil liberties and kind of co communist uh, movement at the time, uh, you know, and, and which, which I, I can imagine it would have been a, a, an interesting place in the, in the 1940s. And, and, uh, you know, and, and the book goes some way to kind of capturing that kind of spirit that seems to seems to arrive for a decade or so and you know and then gradually gradually fade away which which and then there are a couple of passages in the book that are very nice um you know very nicely articulate this idea of like gradually something fading away or 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 being lost um so i can i can see um i can see a question um in the chat so it, it's um so the question is uh, you talked about a world within a world which is inhabited by women um, I was curious about how do women within these worlds talk about their companions and about companionship and love in the book. So that's the first question in, in the chat. Right, right. Um, well, I, I, I think uh, that, is basic, that is pretty much what the book is about, actually. Think about it. Um, it is about uh, all three women, love Yamuna and the Suhu, her grandmother and Lalita, who's grandmother's younger sister, all three of them are sort of uh, talking about the, the kind of companions they've had and the kind of companionship that they've seen. And, uh, and also about the loneliness uh, in, in their lives and, uh, you know, uh, their relationship basically with the society at large. So uh, 
when they are girls, their preoccupation is with uh, the older women who are minding them and who are uh, constantly trying to get them in shape to be married off and sent off somewhere. And then once they are married, the preoccupation is with about whether or not they have children, whether or not they are pregnant, whether or not they have had a miscarriage, uh, you know, whether or not their husband is beating them up, drinking, gambling, you know, the sort of preoccupations that keeps changing. And then in the case of the protagonist, uh, she she has uh, it's it's a very sparse novel in that sense. There aren't too many characters that come and go, and so uh, everybody who comes in has a sort of a role to play in the main character's uh, uh, book. But without making it too cliche about but, and talking about in terms of companionship, talking about the her romantic interests, I thought I'd talk about her best one of her close friends who comes in the book and uh you know who's just had a very bad night out and uh, they go in search of you know they go on a bike in search of uh, an eye pill which is banned still in uh, chennai and uh, you know this kind of uh, this is a kind of a very intimate act to perform uh, to confide in somebody about being violated to confide in to go with somebody to find a solution uh, you know so 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 that is the kind of world that exists. Yeah, and I think that um, that yeah, it's it's like it's through multiple relationships. It's not just and there's not just one kind of companionship or one kind of love, but like it's a different um, different kinds of it. And often within the same the same relationships, you have like you know the layers and and uh, and and nuances there. I. Um, so I, I I myself have a couple of more questions, and we have about ten minutes left. Um, I just want to say, like, if anyone has questions, put them in the in the Q and A, uh, or in the chat box, or you know, or raise your hand, or any 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 medium that you prefer. Uh, and while I'm while you're waiting, I'll I'll you know I I have since I said I have a couple of more questions left, uh, I'll ask them as well. Uh, so um, so there was one chapter um, in in the book which in which the CAA protests you know kind of come to the forefront well i mean they they come to the forefront in in many places and specifically the police in in manaras and so on uh, but there, there's one there's one chapter where there is a there's a party going on you know uh, in in a house uh, and then um, then people play you know the ikbal bano uh, rendition which of course so became kind of emblematic of the of the CAA protests um, and for me what was interesting about that chapter was that there was both a sense of involvement with, but also a sense of estrangement from uh, from the movement, which I think is, is something that is inevitable because uh, because none of well and a uh, barring in, in, in your chapter barring one individual, uh, the others are not directly at at threat at threat uh, from something like the the CAA, uh, and so. There is, of course, a kind of solidarity um, with with those who are at it, but also a kind of, of privilege in being able to have a party in a, in a room where you're playing Iqbal Bano, right? Without feeling that sense of sense of threat, and what happens when that's displaced by, by someone who actually does feel that? Um, so I was I was wondering how you came at uh, at at this uh, at this issue, and specifically how you come at it as as a writer, given given that in this context. Um, both you and I are operating from a position of relative security um, about an issue that's life and death, right? So, 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 how do you kind of uh, look at that with respect to both involvement and estrangement? Right. I mean, I mean, as you've sort of observed it very correctly, the entire chapter is there. I mean, every thing that is fit in fit in there is a very uh, sort of a very deliberate. Uh, point that is there to make and it's a political point but one thing is that we may sort of we may get it and and but we may never really we will never really fully get uh, the, the severity of and the horror of what could possibly happen right especially when you're having your parties and when you're you know, from a certain class and and um so the and these things were happening right we were going out uh, around that time, it was pre-COVID, and then there were friends who uh, who were there, and the way they spoke about CAA was very different from the way you were speaking about it, uh, you know. And and so this this was there, uh, and I wanted to uh, make a note of it. And it's very deliberate that there is 
just that one person uh, who's from the community itself that is there uh, in, you know, in that party, in that particular space, it's very deliberate to sort of create that tension uh, uh, and, and to sort of also see a parallel between uh, how our society is designed, right? What about the love jihad last book? Who are they targeted at? They targeted at women of a particular community and men of a particular community. Current political system is sort of designed to, uh, I mean, if anybody should and can understand what the horrors of uh, where we are politically today, it is women from within the system, right? Who have, the women like Lalita, who firsthand seen how dangerous uh, Brahminical patriarchy is, right? Which is right. the ruling yeah. ideology of the day. Yeah, and of course, like different people experience that differently based on, you know, to use the very famous on Baitka term, it's a graded hierarchy, right? So different people experience that differently based on on where in that house with 15 floors and no ladders, in, in what room are in what room they're in. Um, there's another question. You had mentioned an author whose work you admire early in the meeting. I think her name starts with J. Can you repeat the name, please? It's Jamaica Kincaid. Uh, yeah, and you could maybe elaborate a little bit on, on what you find uh, admirable about, right. about her work. Right. Right. Um, I sort of was introduced to Jamaica Kincaid's work through New Yorker, and I think they had a podcast in which somebody was reading out her work, and that's how it, uh, I first uh, read. Uh, so the first chapter of Annie John was there in, uh, in was published in New Yorker, and then it went on to be published as a novel, and then there's another novel of hers called Lucy. Now, um, uh, when I read both of these works, uh, like I said earlier, um, I felt like I was reading something universal. I felt like I was reading something that was my own as well. I felt like I can totally relate to this, you know, uh, uh, the way the girls are being brought up, the relationship, even though it's worlds apart from where they are. Uh, the, I felt like there was something universal and something very, very uh, common to the women of both societies. And so I went looking for her and that's how I found Lucy and, uh, and and even in uh, and John and I've hidden a couple of quotes to her in this book as well uh, so which is kind of the fun thing you can do when you're writing a book you should do that thing where on so, Goodreads you can put notes you know so you can even have notes where where you can you can annotate your own book on Goodreads so you know so everyone else can oh, wow. see can see what uh, yeah yeah what 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 the you know what uh, you can you can comment on your own book with passages and annotate it yeah okay I think I'll do that <laughs> <laughs> Um, so there's another question. How has writing this book changed you as a person? Are there things you wrote seven years ago or whenever you wrote the first draft that you found yourself disagreeing with, happy with, pleasantly surprised by, or I guess to add unpleasantly surprised by if, if that happened? Uh, yeah, yeah. One of the things that changed over the, I mean, the novel is the same, but also it's completely different in a way. I think people who go through years with the book will totally understand uh, that the essence of it remains the same, but then you've changed. And so the world you're building is also changing uh, and the world around you is changing. And so you're responding to that as well. Um, so one of the things that I, uh, that I felt less and less a need for was to, uh, was to explain myself or, or to, um, you know, or to sort of explain what we are talking about. Uh, increasingly, I think it's not, it's no longer needed. If you're, an, if you're an Indian English writer, it is understood that English is not the first language and you are operating in a space of multiple languages. And so it is okay. And it's in fact really good for your work to reflect that, you know, uh, multiple uh, experience. So that is one thing that sort of changed for me. And the other thing was, of course, I had put in a lot of food, a lot more than there is already. And uh, at some point we said, my editors and I said, uh, maybe this is not a food book. So maybe there shouldn't be so much eating. But, but we kept a lot of uh, food in the book because it's nice to read about women eating. <laughs> so, so, so that's one. 
Yeah, that, the multiple perspective thing uh, reminds me again of Ferrante because this whole thing of the idea of Frantumaglia and the boundaries between the kind of self and the world dissolving and she has that like really vivid vivid imagery for that. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, so that's just like I was, was called of that. Uh, so yeah, another question, uh, was the decision to write this novel in the first person obvious because Yamuna is in the present or was it something else that helped you decide? Um, so when I sat down to write the first, I know I'm going to sound like totally kooky person, but when I first, when I sat down to write the, write, right, like the first couple of thousand words came from somewhere else. Like it was an act of creation. It was not a deliberate, I didn't put my politics into it. I didn't, I was not even thinking, I was not doing anything. I was just, uh, dipping into somewhere that the creative well that is there. Right. And so. And that voice just happened to be in first person when I, uh, when this first started. And then over the years, I considered if this should change uh, or not, but then it just never felt right because I'd first heard it in my head in first person. And so I, it was always that it should be in first person. And then, of course, I thought that we should, we should hear as many women as possible. So I decided let everybody speak their own, tell their own story. Yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting how how it's like it's really hard to shift POVs because you're the same person, but you're, you're, obviously you're, you're, your uh, characters are all different, and they need to have different voices. And so, and how do you can how do you keep like how do you keep making each of them distinct? Uh, you know, that's always a always a challenge uh, because you're still you're still the same person with your own mannerisms and your know, internalized forms of, of communication. With but I think it, 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 the book does a great job of, of actually having distinct people all speaking in, in the first person. And that's some, and I think that's where letters really help because I mean, I, I think that, um, that, uh, it's much, it's, it's somewhat easier to express personality through the written word. And I think, and there's a point in the book where one of the characters you say, I think flirts better over text than, than in person, <laughs> it's just, it's just easy. And, and, and that reminds me of a, a smile Kadare line where a man can be braver, um, in, in writing, <laughs> um, so it, it, it's a, and so I think it's like it's somewhat easier to to be able to flesh out personalities through the act of letter writing than through dialogue because dialogue is something much more ingrained, ingrained, um, uh, ingrained in us, and that actually leads us into another question. Um, which is, you mentioned that the language in the book feels like a translation. Uh, so how conscious was the choice to write it like that, and is it difficult to write in English while carrying within it the, the characteristics of the local language? In fact, actually, I find it the other way around. I find it easier to write like that because I find that that's my style. And so uh, uh, so then I'm not trying too hard. I'm not trying to impress anybody. I'm just trying to say what I want to say and then move on. I'm not really sitting on the dictionary, in front of the dictionary, trying to figure out what is the most beautiful way of saying this. Instead, I'm just saying what is the most efficient way of saying this and then moving on to the next sentence. Um, but... Uh, was it a conscious choice? I don't know because I mean, you we all when we set out to write, we all want to be like a great writer, <laughs> you know. And uh, what is a great writer is just drilled into us through our English textbooks in tenth standard and eleventh standard, and and so uh, so there are there were times when I was just being a little indulgent, and then I said, okay, enough, <laughs> like, you know, you have to like just sound like yourself, you know, not like a pretentious. Uh, person wanting to be like a white man writing so um so, so yeah so it, it took a while to sort of cultivate this voice but I think because this is my second book and because I have I had some I had really good editors uh, working with me on book, who kept it real and my agent as well they, they sort of felt like oh this is your voice let's go with this and you know that helped me a this is a, this, that's really interesting because the, the, the next question is actually directly directly on that point is that um, how was your experience different while writing a work of fiction when compared to your earlier work of non-fiction did you change anything about the way you wrote or thought about the story or the characters right, right. yeah i mean quite a bit actually uh, because the last one was a very very different sort of exercise it was reportage it was the interviews and it was uh, it was heartbreaking actually to do that. And so I was glad to sort of be happy to be doing something else after that. Um, but what it what it prepared me for was uh, feedback and edits and things like that. And so 
that I was able I was able to already say that uh, what I write is not what's going to come out, and so it's going to go through a journey of its own. That it prepared me for. Um, but but that, 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 that's funny because you point in your book where you say art is a lot about ego, but you're talking about how. As an artist, you had to basically leave your ego by the at check your ego uh, out of the door. <laughs> <you> <laughs> <can't> <laughs> <be>. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, your ego gets really, really bruised uh, <laughs> when you are trying to get a fiction book out. I think we can all agree on that. Uh, um, but um, but I mean, I did have. I mean, there were places where you know you you say no, no, this is this this is how much I'll compromise. So that you can do in fiction. Uh, you can, but in nonfiction. Uh, you're dealing with facts, and you're dealing with how to tell this story in the most efficient manner possible. And so, uh, actually, that was uh, even though it was a lot of work, it was easier to write my nonfiction book than it was to get this right. I mean, you can see it took about uh, nine years to get the book out. So, and when I sent this draft out, I said, "This is it. The story is done. There can be no more. Not even one more word. Uh, so it's over." You know, I I completely agree that that fiction is is much more soul crushing than in the, the act of writing is much more soul crushing than than nonfiction. This is actually a question, and it's funny because this question is addressed to both of us on a slightly different issue, which is that uh, that Gotham and Cripper's books both deal with an idea uh, of if you're really free, are you really are you really free if there are rules bearing down upon you? Uh, did either of you observe any other parallels between your your books when you when you read them. Well, so my answer is well, well both of them have a very ambiguous breakup, but that apart, that is one kind of thing. <laughs> but, but, but that but that apart, I thought I thought like language, uh, the preoccupation with language was something that was that was a common theme that ran through the books. Um, a way that language is used uh, not just as a reflection of the world, but also in many ways it's used to 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 create the world, and it does it doesn't just illustrate the you know, like the rules as the, as the questioner said or the hierarchies. But also plays a part in, in creating them, uh, you know, and, and that's been a fascination that I have had for a long time, and I, I did see a, uh, that in in your book as well. Right, right. For me, I think it was uh, the one thing that that I found fascinating that that was sort of it was almost uh, uh, one person, like in in my case, Yamuna is trying to sort of uh, save her home, protect her home, and in Hila's case, she's trying to break down the wall, and. Uh, and so I found that really fascinating. I think this is a nice segue into for me to sort of also talk about the wall, uh, which I really enjoyed reading. And I found it to be sort of, uh, you know, really both grand and intimate, which I think is a really, really, uh, it, it's an achievement to sort of be able to do that. And that, you know, uh, I think this, this could also be seen as being common with both our books. And now that I think about it, which is that, the book I, th I thought the world was about uh, you know our right to question anything or anyone trying to limit the human experience uh, you know to question why status quo lulls some people into inaction even if they are not the biggest beneficiaries of status quo in that particular system in which they are in and uh, also you know the society and people's general discomfort with troublemaker troublemaker women you know who sort of wear their desires on their sleeves and and that sort of, uh, you know, about why can't you just, you know, go do your thing? <laughs> why can't you just mind your own business? Why do you have to poke your nose in all of this? I found that, that there was some sense of that, but we, they're vastly different books. Uh, they're yeah. vastly different. Uh, and I oh. think it's a very, very accomplished book. I have it right here with you. Please go and thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. No, but there was this exactly uh, just you talk about the, the grand and the and the kind of uh, mundane because one of the questions I had, which uh, which I'm out of time uh, to, to to ask more like an observation, um, was a uh, uh, dreaded comment, not a question. <laughs> uh, so there's a there's a, a Colin Turbin in the Master has like a beautiful line where he talks about a house, and he says that the house stood there, uh, and and in its uh, in its kind of smallness, it was. A statement against the stupidity of like grand grand questions. I'm really mangling the quote, and you know, I'll 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 I'll, 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 I'll look up the original one. Uh, but I thought that that was really interesting about about the um, about your book was that that there was a certain kind of 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 skepticism about the stupidity of like the big grand theories, um, and how a lot of that grandness actually comes through you know the everyday lives uh, of people, and in, in this case, the everyday lives of, of women. 
so my, my, to close my my last question is, is a, you know very straightforward and what, what's next uh, what are we going to see after this will there be a, a, an, another book dealing with these characters um, you know will, will we will we know what happens after that somewhat somewhat tantalizing lazing uh, conclusion uh, or, or will are you planning a different fiction piece altogether I mean, in different world? I think immediately after i'm planning a different uh, fiction sort of uh, maybe novella or a short story collection side yeah but but the thought that these people could come back later is there um, and that maybe some of them and some of their stories are a little bit unfinished it's there and uh, <laughs> uh, two people suggested that the, the sequel be called what we know about him <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i, I, I can see i can see i can see both sides of the argument that particular argument <laughs> well At first i cringed and then i was like hmm, more i think about it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, well, well, I hope we hope to to meet these characters again because they are extremely vivid, striking, and and you do feel like you want to know a little more of what happens next. So here's hoping to see them again. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, I'll hand back over to um, to our, our, our moderator. So thanks so much. This was a wonderful thank conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gautam. I had thank so you. much fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you both. This was so great, and of course, we're both like we're all looking forward to next books from both of you. And uh, I also feel like all of us have got so much more reading to do now after this session. Like we, we can so many books that you've recommended, so many things that you've talked about. I think all of us are very excited to go and explore all of them. So thank you to the two of you for joining us. This has been wonderful, and of course, thank you. for uh, thank you to the audience and all of their questions in next month and uh, we'll be putting follow us so you'll know exactly what we're up to month on month thank you so much uh, everybody have a good weekend and uh, we'll see you next time